standard cloud systems, Amazon for example. But most HPC applications require a combination of high performance compute, high performance network and storage, possibly using an application accelerator and most clouds can't support that. The answer is to build an HPC facility, wrap a cloud business model around it, and there's still a trade-off between the needs of HPC applications and the on-demand cloud delivery model. But with HPC clouds like SGI's Cyclone, you can get close to having the best of both worlds. Application performance can be accelerated by parallel programming and for many simulations of real processes, that's quite easy in theory as the real processes tend to have many, many components. In drug design, there are millions of chemical interactions to consider. In aircraft, there are millions of components in weather forecasting the atmosphere is split into large numbers of compartments, each of which can be processed independently during a time step. The complexity is not in finding parallelism, it's in managing the interaction between a chemical and a target area in the human body, or between one aircraft component and another, or between one area of the atmosphere and its nearest neighbor. You need to expose enough parallelism to keep the processor busy most of the time, but you also need to synchronize the different parallel threads at appropriate intervals. We spent decades learning how to write serial programs that represent parallel events. Now we have to unlearn that, that serialization. There are two commonly used programming methodologies for parallel systems today. OpenMP and the MP stands for multiprocessing, extends C and Fortran to cater for shared memory parallelism. MPI, that's the message passing interface, supports distributed parallelism in clusters. There are many emerging language extensions to help scalability to large processor core counts or to support accelerators, but it's too early to say which will become the next standard. There are a number of software issues beyond just parallel programming. In every HPC system, if every HPC system is different in terms of the type of multi-core processors and accelerators, how do we write efficient, portable HPC applications? Can we move current programming languages, tools, and technologies forward, or do we need to throw them all away and start again? And the unknown details of cloud platform brings further complexity. A real concern I have is where are the skills? Many graduate programmers today don't understand computer architecture terribly well. Do we need to build much, much better tools to hide the complexity from the programmer? I'm now going to look at what people do with HPC systems initially at a high level and then I'll drill into a few examples to show the sort of tools, techniques and technologies that can deliver great performance. So at one end of the scale, um, looking at drug design, um, HPC is used to analyze different chemicals to, to identify how they can build the, the best drugs. At the other end of the scale, cosmology examines the formation of galaxies and the Big Bang that creates, created the universe as we know it. Now, it's impossible to experiment with galaxies, so computer simulation is the only way to support advances in theoretical physics. And in between the very smallest and the very largest, um, you can simulate the environment for weather and global wor warming forecasts, simulate car and aircraft design so that a new model can be brought to market without ever building a prototype, and simulate nuclear weapons or, more importantly, stockpiles of unused weapons. HPC clusters and grids are used to design and test computer chips with billions of transistors. Crypt crypt analysis, breaking complex ciphers for security services is another application. And in financial markets, pricing of complex derivatives and risk analysis. And finally, bottom right, the analysis of seismic surve surveys and simulation of oil reservoirs. So what I've just gone through very quickly is some examples of the areas that are covered by HBC applications. What I'm going to do now is drill into um, a few applications and demonstrate the benefit that some of the tools and, and technologies that I've been talking about bring. Um, LS Dyna is an application used to simulate car crashes. And the interesting performance numbers here are maybe 
comparing four cores with four cores plus a GPU. Um, and the numbers in the right-hand columns are the seconds to complete this, this test case. So by adding a GPU to a four-core system, you can more than double the performance. Um, the benefit of that is that either you can get through twice as much work if you have a large workload of, of many different crash tests you need to analyze, or you can accomplish the same workload on half of the number of systems. The next case looks at the performance of the mathematical fast Fourier transform. That's the main algorithm in the interpretation of seismic surveys. Scaling this computation to a large number of nodes can be difficult, but the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany developed an FFT library that uses a number of their proprietary parallel processing techniques. And you can see that the lowest line is the performance that they were getting and the scalability. And they deliver not only better performance up to 128 processors, but their method continued to scale up to 256 and probably beyond. They, they haven't tested beyond that. This example looks at the performance of testing multiple financial market trading strategies. Each test case, and there are thousands, has a mix of shared data, which is streaming market data, historic data and some local data. And managing this data across multiple nodes in a cluster is really difficult. In this test, Lab49, a Wall Street consulting firm, used Scaleout software's Scaleout state server to manage the data. Effectively, instead of moving data to jobs, packets of work are moved to the nodes where the appropriate data is already stored. And not only is the performance better than the alternative data placement up to 16 nodes, but it continues to scale linearly up to the maximum number of nodes that were tested. FPGAs, or Field Programmable Gate Arrays, are chips whose characteristics can be changed dynamically. They're difficult to program, but can be very, very good at doing jobs that require large-scale parallelism and where the processor can effectively be designed to fit the target job instead of the other way around. Now, law enforcement agencies want their own communications to be secret, but at the same time, they want to be able to intercept and read the communication of undesirables. Now, modern computers can break ciphers through a brute force attack, but it takes a long, long time. Using FPGAs, they were able to deliver significantly higher performance, and it's, it's sort of of the order of several orders of magnitude, not just sort of two or three times faster. So for the right type of job, FPGAs can deliver a phenomenal performance. Very few people used Cray vector supercomputers as they cost so much. Many supercomputers cost perhaps less than $1 million, and so many more were sold. But an HPC system today is a cluster of low-cost commodity servers with a high-performance network and a rack of 32 systems um, connected with 10 gigabit Ethernet costs only a few hundred thousand dollars. But it's thousands of times more powerful than the original Cray Vector machines. So HPC capabilities are now available to a much wider audience than in the past. And HPC is no longer limited to the government research labs or very large corporations. Most universities and departments and small companies can afford an HPC system. And Intel reckoned that about 25% of all server processors are used in HPC systems. So HPC is finding new markets at significantly lower price points. So the number of HPC systems is increasing very rapidly. I mentioned the top 500 list earlier on. If, if, you, if you're not aware of it, it's like a top of the pops chart for supercomputers. It's maintained by a group of academics, updated twice a year, and provides detailed information about the 500 fastest supercomputers in the world. It can be interesting and useful to see the trends over time. Over five years, the top system has grown from 5,000 to a quarter of a million cores. And the 500th place system has grown from 500 to 5,000 cores. Note that what was the top system five years ago is barely on the list anymore. From this, we can learn that in five years' time, there will be hundreds of systems with hundreds of thousands of cores, 
and systems with tens of thousands of cores will be commonplace and we really need to prepare users for, for this massive change. So HPC systems will enable us to do things that we couldn't do before, even just a couple of years ago. The performance, price performance offered is, is quite awesome. Instead of computers helping to pr pr helping with the product design, you can do product optimization without ever building a prototype. Instead of taking years to analyze a single human genome, you'll be able to analyze an individual's genome in less than a day and design drugs tailored to the needs of that individual. But we need to learn to cope with the massive scale and the fact that heterogeneous systems will become very, very common. It's not actually clear if Confucius ever said this, but it's the sort of thing he would have said. And many people think this quote is supposed to be a blessing, while other sources claim it's a curse, bringing unwanted complication on the lives of the cursed. I think we can safely say that in HPC land we live in interesting times, but it's going to be a few years before we know if this is a blessing or a curse. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you, John, for an interesting presentation. I see one hand raised. Um, Tony Seymour, I'm going to unmute you. You are unmuted. Hello, can you hear? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering what the implications are for cryptography over the next, um, well, coming towards the end of the decade. Do we have to rethink the way we're handling cryptography at the moment? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so, so in in the past, the the strength of the, the codes has always been just a bit stronger than the computers that were generally available. And if we've now got to a position where with FPGAs we have systems that are much, much more powerful for, for um, this sort of problem, then you will need to make um, sensitive information far more difficult to get at. So yes, we will need to, th to rethink things. The, the same method. The, the same methods can be used, but you just need to use longer keys. Unmuted. Okay. Um, uh, there's one question from uh, Olga Arshova. How much the security of HPC is addressed at the moment? Security of HPC. I'm not quite sure what. Um, what just, just a minute. Olga, I'm going to unmute you. Just a minute. Yes, Olga, go ahead. Hello? Hi, Olga. Can, can, can you go into a bit more detail about um, what you mean by security of HPC? For some reason, she's not able to speak, I think, but she's typing. Um, protection from hackers, that's what she uh, means. Okay, for protection from hackers, absolutely no different to um, any other data centers, cloud computing facilities, or whatever. Um, the, I guess the problems that they would potentially have are the same, but also the, um, the ways that you can um, avoid people hacking into your system are the, the same f as for major data centers, so no different issues for HPC. Okay, any other questions? We'll wait for a few more questions. In the meantime, uh, John, I have one question from my side. Uh, where is UK in all this uh, journey? What What is happening in UK about uh, HPC? Um, this, this is a good question. I mean, nowadays, most systems are based around um, x86 processors. Um, the, the UK industry has long been um, strong in terms of parallel processing going, going back to the, the day, early days of the transputers. 
Um, so there are some very strong software skills um, within UK industry.